Welcome to the miracle at Pentecost. Pentecost is truly a miracle on several fronts. The event of 2,000 years ago and another that began over 30 years ago. The painting of the Pentecost experience found in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. We're going to learn during this presentation how two Christian people's lives, Dallas artist Torger Thompson and arts patronist Maddie Carruth Bird, member of one of Dallas, Texas pioneer families, connected with Pentecost and produced an inspired painting and an incredible showcase for the artwork that draws and touches scores of people from around the world each year. Both of these unusual people had life-changing encounters, each in their own way with the power of God in their lives. This is also an account of Thompson and Mrs. Bird's bond with Pentecost, the inspiration they shared in the Holy Spirit, and the respect and admiration they held for one another. The Holy Spirit, first as an idea and then as inspiration, profoundly affected and changed the lives of Torger Thompson and Maddie Carruth Bird. Their own experiences linked with the experience of Pentecost was like Elijah's when he fled into the wilderness. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Both Thompson's and Mrs. Bird's encounters with Pentecost were like Elijah's Mount experience, a still, small voice. Our story begins with Thompson, who in witness to his faith, traveled around the country with a trailer full of lights, sound and drawing equipment he used for what he called chalk talks. These chalk talks were Bible stories Thompson related to scores of church audiences over the years. His presentations were colorful, illustrated Bible stories and lessons, which came to life with special fluorescent lighting effects. Thompson began his Pentecost experience in the words and melody of a song while doing one of his chalk talks. At 70, Thompson relates the event that would set the stage for his life's greatest mission. He was at the Little Bethlehem Church in Dallas. It was July in Texas. And you know, I have to have the windows closed when I do my chalk talks, because I have to keep it dark in the church for the lighting to be effective. Well, it was hotter than a pistol in that church, I can tell you. They had no air conditioning. I was drawing the Lord on the cross and suddenly a lady in the church threw her purse in the air and shouted out, Hallelujah! I just kept drawing the Lord. The minister began humming, and the church softly joined in. Soon the whole place was alive with this intense, quiet humming. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I'll tell you, that'll make the hair on your neck stand up. Singing just got stronger and stronger, and I thought the place would burst. I wanted to hear more and more. I just kept on drawing, adding more details to the picture, more colors in the sky behind the cross, so I could keep listening. I didn't want anything to stop that precious moment. My life is a jigsaw puzzle, you see. Piece by piece, it all fell together. You see, you can't understand this until your life is almost over. Then you can see the whole picture the puzzle makes. That little church was a key piece in the puzzle, somehow. I just don't know how. I've had lots of people ask me why I didn't speak in tongues, being the Pentecost painter and all. Well, I just hold up my hand and show them my thumb and my first two fingers, the ones I hold my brush with. I speak with these, I'd tell them. They paint, they don't talk. And that's how God wants to use me. Thompson knew the power of the Holy Spirit, but he couldn't put together that special musical event in that little church as the moment when his own baptism in the Holy Spirit happened. Not in wind, earthquake, and fire, but a still, small voice that made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. With that single event, 
Thompson developed a need to define and focus his witness. He knew it was to be a painting since the early 40s, but of what he wasn't sure. Then Thompson heard a sermon on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, where mute, timid witnesses of the Christ event were turned into firebrands, who with no regard for their lives, declared their love and set examples by their lives of Jesus become Christ and Messiah and the promise of life after death. The new Christian church after Pentecost flew fearlessly in the faces of those Romans who emphatically did not believe in life after death and whose government would put to death in an instant those who would profess otherwise. These ancient events moved Thompson to act on his vision and faith. He would somehow, when others his age were getting ready for retirement, produce a mammoth painting commemorating the phenomenon of Pentecost. And amazingly, just the sheer promise of Thompson's painting and its powerful message would move Mrs. Bird, this Christian woman of means and influence, to embrace the idea of the painting and ultimately provide the Romanesque building in which the painting now resides, and scores of people from around the world visit each year. Mrs. Bird said that religion, represented in the arts of words, sculpture, and painting, was of singular importance to her. Mrs. Bird, through her establishing and maintaining the Biblical Arts Center, is witness of her faith daily to those who come to share Torger's representation of Pentecost as abundant life. My family came to Dallas before there were freeways and tall buildings and even telephones. It was a time of country, farms and growing. Not too many years before we settled here, buffalo grazed in Indians camp not far from where my family home is today and where the Biblical Arts Center now stands. My parents' single greatest gift to me is my faith. Over the years, that faith sustained me and gave exquisite purpose to my life. I discovered great joy in art that celebrates our religious heritage. In that joy, I determined that a place for religious expressions of art for everyone to contemplate and enjoy would be built. He said, go and witness unto me. This building and its paintings, sculptures, and words make up my witness to that which is greater than I. This Romanesque building was built around the painting's original temporary shelter. It was designed to showcase the now named Miracle at Pentecost painting. The Biblical Arts Center is operated by the Miracle at Pentecost Foundation, which I established in 1965 as a private, not-for-profit, non-denominational institution. This is an art museum where people of every faith can have the opportunity of witnessing the Bible as it inspires all of us in the arts. Today, the Biblical Arts Center is a showcase for art of the Bible and historical artifacts, along with educational lectures and seminars that are presented in our galleries. The Colonnade, Miracle at Pentecost, and my Founders Gallery have numerous works of art on permanent display. The East Gallery is where our traveling exhibitions are presented. Exhibits change every 8 to 12 weeks, so there's always something new to see. All of this was accomplished in order that the testimony and power of Pentecost and the events and people of the Bible may be shared with believers and unbelievers alike through fine art and the written and spoken word. We built the Biblical Arts Center to reflect early Christian architecture. The entrance to the building is modeled on Paul's gate in Damascus. We've given the building a feeling of the first century with the heavy wooden doors, arches, and stone columns. Our atrium has a life-size replica of the Garden Tomb of Christ. Of course, Torger's painting, The Miracle of Pentecost, is our centerpiece. Here's how it came about. Thompson's Miracle at Pentecost painting began as an idea during World War II. After hearing a sermon about the Holy Spirit, he did a rough 9 by 18 inch drawing and then threw it away. His wife Alice got it out of the trash. From that 9 by 18 inch sketch that Alice saved, drawings began to flow, growing into a series of working drawings, 
two feet wide, then four feet, then six, all of which would feed his dream of a 20 foot high by 124 foot long canvas on which he would paint not only the spiritual outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, but a collection of over 200 New Testament characters, all who loved and followed Jesus. He worked at home, filling every hour he spent away from his downtown commercial art studio, drawing and planning the dream painting. Nights, weekends, every day free from the business, the volume of Thompson's sketches and drawings grew. Alice's living room became dominated by a four by 24 foot model drawing of numerous Pentecost characters. Thompson researched the scriptures. He continued to draw and plan the painting while thinking about the events that led up to Pentecost. I read everything I could about Pentecost and I drew. Pentecost set the stage for 2,000 years of spiritual growth and witness. This ancient harvest festival became transformed into a living spiritual harvest, welcoming generations into the body of Christ, the church, paving the way for his return in glory. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, has threaded its way throughout the centuries. Well, with all this in my mind, somehow I just had to paint it. One of the problems I had to work out was where to place the event. The scripture says, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him unto the house which he enters, and tell the householder, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. My early drawings of Pentecost were of the apostles and his followers in the upper room of the Last Supper as just described in Mark 22, 7. It's assumed by some that on Pentecost, the disciples gathered to pray and wait on the Lord at the place of the Last Supper, the upper room. The 16th century Spanish master known as El Greco is one of many artists who painted Pentecost in the Passover's upper room setting. It was the early 50s. Thompson got a call. An unidentified man told Thompson that putting Pentecost in the upper room was an error. Pentecost did not take place in the upper room, the caller said. Thompson stopped work. He picked up his research, meeting to no avail with a number of ministers to help resolve the problem of location. Finally, he got with Temple Emmanuel's Rabbi David Lefkowitz in Dallas. Rabbi Lefkowitz showed Thompson an old encyclopedia containing a drawing of Solomon's porch. The rabbi read Acts to him. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. When we Jews use the expression, the house, we invariably mean our temple. That's the house, Rabbi Lefkowitz exclaimed. I told the rabbi, you're the last man I'm going to ask about this. I'm going to draw that miracle at the temple, not the upper room. Thompson says he stopped what he was doing and prayed. He focused himself on the task. He needed, he said, a blessing to do the painting. I prayed. Now, Father, you told us in the book of John to ask for what we want in his name, in your son's name, so that's what I'm going to do. I ask you to bless and guide this hard work. I ask you to stand by me and don't let me falter when they tease me about it. I ask you to guide the hand of the artist because the artwork is overwhelming. I'm just going to leave all my worries to you. It was just before dawn when his blessing came. Thompson went to the huge sketch and decided to draw a dove above the head of Peter. 
He knew that the dove would be ultimately erased and replaced with fire, but he felt a need to draw in a temporary dove. As I drew, through the patio doors came the cooing of a morning dove. That dove stayed with me throughout summer. It kept me going. The drawing grew until Thompson had to move out of his house and into an outbuilding in the backyard, which soon had a hole cut in its wall to extend the drawing 10 feet. He began sketches of the tongues of fire and couldn't get them right. I got a hold of Al Barnes, a young artist who had worked for me in the commercial illustration business. Al was in college working on an art degree. I persuaded him to come out and take a look at what I was doing and see if he could help me with the fire. Al asked me if I really believed in all this. I told him I did. Not only that, I said, I needed him to help me draw the tongues of fire. Before our visit was over, I'd asked him and he'd accepted my request to come help an artist getting on in years paint the big painting I didn't feel I'd be able to do without some help. So Al and I got to work. We began by sketching out 120 followers of the Lord for the painting. Now it's true that some of the characters in the painting might well have not been at Pentecost, but I had a good excuse for including every one of them. They were faithful to their Lord, and I wanted to include them. Well, Barnes and I finally finished the scale drawing. Then I went over to a mill in Fort Worth and ordered a huge board and canvas from Scotland. I began calculating costs for brushes and paint. And I began to plan for a building in which to work and show the painting. I had no idea where or how I was going to bring the painting, much less the building, to completion. I prayed, Father, help me finish this painting. Thompson has two years in drawings, planning, and research invested in his dream of painting Pentecost in the first century of the church. It's 1965. Thompson is now 60 years old. The clock is running. He faces a project that could very well burn out a young man of 20. One of the men in his Highland Park Presbyterian Church Bible class, architect Jim Cheek, took up Thompson's cause and set up a showing of the scale drawing with Mrs. Bird, her son Harold Bird Jr., and Bird's wife Roberta. Upon seeing the model, Maddie Bird fell in love with the project. Together, Thompson and Mrs. Bird drew plans not only for a 20-foot high by 124-foot painting, but a temporary building in which to house and show it. A more elaborate structure would be built later. Barnes and I began work on a 4-foot high by a 24-foot long model in my backyard shop. About the same time Torger and Al were working on the model, we began construction of a metal building to house the upcoming work in progress. The land I picked was a prime piece of our old farm on what is now Bodecker at Park Lane. The building didn't take long to build. Torger and Al were working in their new studio by the fall of 1966. Well, I asked the artist to leave the doors open so people could see the work in progress. That didn't bother Torger, but it did Al. He didn't see himself, nor did he want to be known as a religious artist. When people came around, he would disappear. It took nearly a year for them to finish the pilot painting. Al, adamant about not wanting to be associated publicly with a religious piece of art, wouldn't sign his name to the model. So, only because Al wouldn't sign his name, Torger wouldn't either. But the big painting's another story. Everything that happened during those two and a half years he and Torger painted together changed Al. He was wooed and won by the Holy Spirit. When the painting was finished, Al quietly signed both his and Torger's name in the lower right corner. We worked together for over four and a half years on the entire project. From 1966 through 1969 was truly a time of little miracles. Al spent a lot of time and work on Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, the mother of Christ. We painted Peter in, rubbed him out, and painted him in again over and over. We wanted him right. We each had our own idea how he should look. 
Al began to care very much about Peter's appearance. Well, I was on a ship once, and I saw a fellow coming up a gangplank. He had wonderful red hair and a red beard. There goes Peter, I thought. So, Peter has red hair. Simon of Cyrene bore Christ's cross. I'd painted him as a white man, having read that whites and blacks were evenly divided in northern Africa. Then one day, as I was working on the figure just next to Simon, I turned and saw standing behind me a black man. I was struck. I thought, there he is, Simon of Cyrene, standing right there. He said to me, you want me to be Simon of Cyrene. And he is so painted. And then one day around noon, a frail elderly lady appeared in the studio. She had a sweet smile. She put her hand out and said, God bless you for doing something so wonderful as this. I'm so glad somebody is finally doing something about Pentecost so that we can appreciate it better. She didn't stay long. I, I left her briefly to clean up my brushes and get ready for lunch. When I returned, she was gone. The receptionist said she had apparently come on a city bus. She signed the guest book with an Oak Cliff address. Sometime later, I was in Oak Cliff, and she came to my mind. I decided to go by and visit her. I found her street, but not her house. There was a vacant lot where her house should have been. So I went to the house next to the vacant lot and knocked on the door. I asked about the lady and the lot where her house should have been. The neighbor told me it was the right address, but that the lady had died 10 years ago and the house had since burned down. The neighbor told me the lady who lived in the house was a Pentecostal and held meetings in her home. I tell you, doing that painting was for me living a miracle. The people of Pentecost witnessed the presence of God as the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And this is what Al and I painted. It was Pentecost morning. Peter and the apostles had gathered to pray. Suddenly, there was a sound like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. The wind-like sound filled the place where they were praying. Then, what seemed to be flames, described by those there as tongues of fire, came out of nowhere, settling on each of their heads. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in the languages they didn't know as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Many of the Jews who were in Jerusalem for Pentecost heard the roaring sound and came running to see what was happening. They were bewildered hearing their own languages spoken by their disciples. Trying to explain it away, they said, they're drunk, that's all. They've drunk too much new wine. But then Peter's reply rang out, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And I will pour out my spirit on my servants, men and women alike, and they shall prophesy. And I will cause strange demonstrations in the heavens and on the earth, flood and fire and clouds of smoke. And the sun shall turn black and the moon blood red before that day of the Lord arrives. But anyone who asks for mercy from the Lord shall be saved. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, to everyone whom the Lord our God may call. Well, the account goes on to say that everyone who received his word was baptized and that around 3,000 were added as believers to the newly formed church. And the spirit which came upon the followers of Christ on that Pentecost morning has been the source of power for those who believe in him across the centuries to this very day, including me. Pentecost inspired me to paint. It became a miracle for me, a miracle beyond myself that didn't stop even after the painting was finished. Oh, remember, 
that my life is wind, mine eye shall no more see good. It was right after Al and I had finished the painting. I went home. I was working in the yard with my son-in-law, sawing some limbs off a tree. I bent over to pick up a limb, and a little twig, the tiniest thing, went through my left eye. It was very serious. I went right to the hospital, figuring they could do something right away and that I'd be okay. But they were pretty worried. They covered up both of my eyes. I had to lie there two weeks. They didn't want me compensating with my right eye for the injury in my left. And so I was a blind man. Two months after I'd finished the most meticulous detail in that fabulous oil painting, I lay there blind. The doctor was frank. He said he figured that my left eye was just gone and that was it. I don't know what to say about my eye. If you're wondering what I think of God since I was dumb enough to put a stick through my eye, or if you're wondering if I'm mad at God after we finished these many years together and after we finished that painting, well, I tell you, it's been tough. But I'm not mad at God. How many of us ever have a real chance to do something for the Lord? That's the way I look at it. And the word of the Lord says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen. O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for thee. Mrs. Bird did not live to see the dream of her final witness come to completion. But hers, Thompson's, and Barnes' testimony now lives in yours.